You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It is Thursday, October 18th, 2018. My name is Sam Steeter. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, director of the Revolving Door Project at the CEPR, that's the Center for Economic Policy and Research, if I'm not mistaken, Jeff Hauser, on what we should demand and expect of a democratically controlled House. Also on the program today, Republicans threaten Social Security and Medicare after doubling the deficit with tax cuts for millionaires. Meanwhile, Trump panics about his failure on immigration. Meanwhile, Trump panics about his biz partners revealed to have murdered a Washington Post columnist. Chuck Schumer blew it on judges, and then Chuck Schumer blew it on judges again. Another study shows Obama to Trump voters motivated by race and immigration. Key state Senate seats across the country get a big boost. And Facebook, and this is so hard to believe, lied about video hits to drive their ad rates And destroyed a bunch of print media publications along the way. The Republican ACA lawsuit could destroy pre-existing condition, uh, pre-existing protect uh, condition protections, even for employee coverage. And uh, racist right wingers, you can relax. We're going to assure you, you are safe from the Honduran caravan. And lastly, Robert Mueller prepping for post-midterm crap storm. All this and more on today's program. Uh, yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, Thursday. Uh, Michael is um, is out. He's, it's going he's, west. Where is he? Iowa. Idaho. Idaho. I- Iowa. Um, he is uh, doing a uh, Norm Peterson is it the uh, guy from Cheers? Yeah, it's a Norm Peterson convention. Yeah, it's weird. I can't believe that show is still pulling in people for that convention. Uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, they're doing a conference on the, uh, in, the the international dark web. What do they call themselves? The intellectual dark web. Yeah, intellectual dark web. Not inter- intellectual Very much not international dark, dark web. Dark web, more in- like it. <laughs> there you go. Um, and that it's that kind of talk, uh, Jamie, that keeps uh, Dave Rubin from debating us because he doesn't doesn't approve of that. It's the very civility, rude. Uh, Sorry, Dave. Uh, th- thank you, Jamie. Thank you uh, for apologizing. And uh, folks, uh, tomorrow, uh, Brendan and I will be also headed west to uh, Politicon, uh, where, is, where on uh, Sunday at 4.30. Now, I don't think it's live, but I do believe there will be video of this. Ultimately, I will be debating Charlie Kirk from Turning Points USA. And the topic will be um, is Donald Trump good for the middle class? Big league. Big league. Uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have a nice little uh, debate, and uh, I will uh, I'll be moderating a panel on uh, should we be socialists? And uh, found out sometime last week um, there are no socialists on the panel, uh, but um, I guess that that makes the question more uh, relevant. Because yeah. if we already were socialists, then you'd, why would we even ask? You'd be biased. Right. There you go. Uh, but we will endeavor to persevere. And uh, I'm also sitting on a panel talking about Mike Pence. I don't. Having, I, I, I got to admit, I haven't dug into that one too much. The only thing I'm going to do, and someone maybe can do this during the show if they want. Um, I interviewed a, uh, an attorney at that Las Vegas uh, tort conference, and I believe it was before the election. It could have been in October 2016, actually, 
or or maybe in the spring of 2016, uh, maybe the fall of 2015, a woman, and I can't remember her name, who had represented foster parents of kids with disabilities in Indiana. Mike Pence wanted to cut the program to provide them essentially an allowance to do that, to pay uh, for tax cuts. Eventually, I think they were sued, and the publicity, he he backed down from that because it doesn't— um, uh, people just sort of think that's a little bit mean. But um, someone wants to dig that up because I could I could use a refresher class and, and how horrible Mike Pence was. Oh, yeah. Outside of the context of being horrible uh, as he is now. I mean, he was an incredibly unpopular governor in Indiana and was looking at the loss of his reelection campaign. Um, Remind me to send you the story on how his delayed response to an HIV outbreak had horrible consequences. Uh, yes, do. I, I recall that. I, I should uh, bone up on that story. He's a horrible person. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're <laughs> one of the things about, um, you know, I, 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 in the past I've talked about being reluctant to participate in Politicon in any way. And um, but there's just too much reminders daily for me that in the world in which I work right within like the sort of the YouTube world and, and more and more this show is um, the viewership in YouTube is expanding our our audio podcast is still uh, very uh, good doesn't grow nearly at the rate that the YouTube is and that's a function of just like I think where younger people are getting their news and I'm glad we're getting younger people to watch the show uh, but I become increasingly aware of What's going on in that world? And um, the left, broadly speaking, is losing in that YouTube universe. Now, part of it is because there's enormous amounts of money being poured into this. There was a story the other day. I'm a little bit off track here, but there was a story the other day about this guy, Mark Stein. We've talked about him in the past. He's this Canadian guy who writes, I think, for the National Review. He sometimes fills in for Rush Limbaugh. He had a deal with CRTV, which is some conservative... uh, um, you know, sort of like network of video stuff that Mark Levin ostensibly runs, but gets its funding from somewhere. And apparently he came down, he lives in, I think, uh, northern Vermont or somewhere like that, and started to do a show and it fell apart, right? He was difficult to work with, or maybe they didn't like the direction. Who knows? You, you don't know with these stories. That's, that's sort of irrelevant. What was relevant is what their payout was. For this guy's show. This is reported by the New York Post. Mark Stein got a payout of four million dollars. Now, it's conceivable to me someone like this signs a five year deal for an Internet uh, station. Highly improbable. But it's conceivable, like, you know, you hear about these things in radio and maybe it's possible and this and that. There is no possible way that Mark Stein was ever going to provide four million dollars of revenue. Never mind the cost of production of the show. I'm talking in terms of like, there's just no way Mark Stein was going to provide four million dollars worth of revenue over a a seven year horizon. Never mind a five year horizon. If they're paying this guy out $4 million, someone is pumping in an enormous money, enormous amount of money into these right wing shows. Gavin McGinnis on the same network, the CRTV. There's no way this guy is driving the revenue that he's paid. There's no way. He's a loss leader, right? Like he's the one who's going to bring them some publicity like that uh, high price show maybe on HBO that doesn't necessarily um, uh, bring back revenue. But for an Internet show like this that depends not on advertising as much as it does direct membership, those loss leader things are a little bit less relevant. So someone is pouring in and subsidizing this thing to the hilt. And nothing like that exists on the left. Nothing. There's nothing even remotely close. Nothing. 
And the, the closest is TYT getting money from uh, the entertainment industry. And you see what they're doing with that money. They're not getting, you know, they're not expanding their socialist programs, right? Uh, it's not like they're expanding ideologically. They're, they're, they're broadening their array of programs. But as one would in an entertainment play, there is no ideological money pouring in or even trickling in or dabbling in. And so, um, you know, that is one of the things that has preoccupied me. And so going and in any way, Attempting to, and maybe I'll fail. I mean, uh, Charlie Kirk is uh, goes on television far more than I do. I mean, this guy is is constantly out there. Uh, he has a staff. Like I got emails, and it's like to Team Kirk, and I'm like, wait a second, he's got a team, but he's Captain Kirk. But I'm going to try and go out there and to um, refute his ideas, and um, perhaps. Uh, make his appeal somewhat diminished. That's what I'm going to try and do. So um, I'm not sure how I got off on that tangent, but that's uh, that's what my weekend's going to be. Hey, folks, uh, one of today's sponsors is newsvoice.com slash majority. As you know, a lot of these guys, uh, we were just talking about this, and we have people who are in, in epistemological bubbles, uh, there are uh, enormous amounts of uh, resources being poured into narrow people's access uh, to uh, different news sources. Uh, there's a new media company out there that has come up with one of their their own responses to these problems. It's called News Voice. It's an app for iOS and Android, which you can access for free if you go to newsvoice.com slash majority. It gives you a personalized news feed by aggregating a mix of mainstream media sources, international sources, and independent media sources. Multiple sources are provided for each news story, uh, both left and right. The entire app is fueled by crowdsourcing. You can upvote stories you think are important so more people will see them. You can add stories to the app. You can add a source that's missing for a story. It's meant to be a completely open and democratized news aggregator that lets you get to every side of every story. They also have a video interview series uh, featuring guests from like Chris Hedges to AOC. Go download the app for free at newsvoice.com slash majority. I put the link under this video if you're watching it on YouTube. We'll put it in the uh, podcast description as we always do with any of the advertisers. Um, Let's, uh, uh, we'll get to uh, the, uh, these videos afterwards because we've got to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking to Jeff Hauser. Uh, not going to be a long, deep, uh, involved thing, but I wanted to get a notion and give people a notion of, of A, what is possible with just Democrats in uh, controlling one house and what we should, we should be building our expectations now. Uh, one, as a way of making sure that people go out and vote and two to hold the Democrats to account, you know, depending on what the, the, um, the landscape is in terms of what party is in and out of power and what levers they have access to, we have to change in terms of how we pressure. There's, I mean, on, in some respects, the, um, the pressure that we apply is a lot more efficient in the context of having people who are susceptible to that pressure. Um, and uh, Democrats are far more susceptible to pressure from the base, from, from a myriad of types of activism uh, than are uh, Republicans, uh, simply because the Republicans drink from a different well. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with the director of the Revolving Door Project, Jeff Hauser.
was very happy. He was very happy. He was very happy in his world. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program the director of the Revolving Door Project at the Center for Policy and uh, Center for Economic Policy and Research, uh, Jeff Hauser. Uh, on uh, his piece, Dems can use subpoena power to reclaim the mantle of populism. But there are other topics I want to talk to you about, Jeff. Welcome to the program. Uh, great to be here. All right, let's start with uh, with this piece um, that you, um, uh, you you wrote the other day. Uh, this is, and let's just for a moment, and uh, you know, knock on wood, the Democrats take the House. This is obviously not a guarantee. Um, you can you can enter into an election where there's a ninety five percent chance that your preferred candidate might win, and apparently, it's possible that um, you know. Five out of 100 times, uh, maybe the non-preferred candidate wins. So Hypothetically. Hypothetically, of course. And uh, so uh, this, let's not take this for granted, but it's also important, I think, to start to formulate notions of what we should expect from a Democratic Congress so that um, we're in a position to give them the message uh, that this, these are our expectations. So how does this work? I mean, w- walk us through this. So— Congress has the ability to conduct oversight on any issue on which uh, they might legislate or on which it comes with directly within their purview. So obviously that includes the executive branch because Congress is the entity that funds the executive branch and passes the laws that govern how the Secretary of State operates, the Secretary of the Treasury, Department of Defense, uh, you name it, all down the line. Uh, so there's significant oversight capabilities there, but Congress can also conduct oversight of businesses that conduct interstate commerce. So that includes Google, that includes Big Pharma, that includes the Koch brothers, that includes the oil industry, that includes uh, payday lenders. Uh, Congress can subpoena, and re- which is to say request under power of law that These corporations provide their CEOs to testify and any documents that Congress wants. Congress has enormous ability to check into what is going on uh, in the world and bring attention to important issues. And that is something that House Democrats can do if they take gavels, even if they can't pass new laws because Trump would veto them. Oh, and, and, and of course, you know, um, we may not, uh, Democrats may not have control of the Senate and et cetera, et cetera. So, all right. Well, so let me ask you this. Um, uh, when, how does the, the Democrat, I mean, do you have a sense of, are there, like, how coordinated are the Democrats? How strategic are they in this? Are they, or is it simply each committee chair is saying, okay, I have X or Y in my sights. These are the folks that I'm going to um, uh, investigate. These are the issues that I want to explore, et cetera, et cetera. How, how, how broadly strategic is this? 
So I think as of now, there are not a lot of uh, strategic plans in place for oversight. For one reason, uh, obviously, a majority has not been secured, and so that's somewhat understandable. For another, congressional staff resources, which are too thin across Capitol Hill, uh, in the overall are especially thin on the side of the minority so most committees um, only have one or two professional oversight staffers uh, who are democrats and so the they are um, under siege right now while the you know trying to monitor what's going on with in the government and with the republican majority so their ability to plan far ahead for what they would do if and when they had the majority is minimal which is why uh, I and others on the outside are going to look to provide some ideas as to what oversight could be. Uh, but the oversight tends to be largely conducted at the committee or subcommittee level, not by leadership, but leadership, of course, uh, checks in frequently. And on some of the more potentially high-profile matters, like going after Donald Trump's taxes or issues in which there might be a fight over a subpoena, I suspect uh, congressional leadership will be in uh, close contact with committee chairs. So to use less D.C. language, that means Pelosi or whomever else might be the speaker in, in a hypothetical Democratic majority would be talking with people like uh, Chairwoman Maxine Waters, who is slated to run the House Financial Services Committee. But theoretically, I mean, this is fascinating. And I think this is this is, you know, um, there's a, there's a little bit of. Uh, I mean, this is a little bit weedy, maybe, or a little bit uh, inside baseball-y, but on some levels, this is like, this is the part of governance that I don't think that people really have a, an acute awareness of. So when, um, when, when, when Pelosi, who or whomever, uh, will be the, the, the majority leader, again, this is, we're not counting our chickens yet, but we're, we're hoping for, sh- for chickens, let's put it this way. Uh, and she goes to Maxine Waters. Maxine Waters and it could be any other uh, uh, chairperson of, of any other committee, what they tell Pelosi in terms of their agenda in, in who they're going to pursue and what areas are they going to pursue is largely a function of people like you. And so here's my question. One, relative to the right, OK, when the right when the conservatives are out of power, like there, my sense is there's a lot more of right wing use than there are you. Uh, <laughs> a, a, I want you to address that. And B, people should also understand that, like the the resources that you have, if you are, let's say, Trey Gowdy and you are not pursuing <laughs> any of these major corporations or any legitimate scandals, but yet you have all these resources is exactly why Benghazi could exist for years. I mean, just address both those things. Sure. Um, yeah, the um, progressive ecosystem is, uh, does not have uh, robust support for uh, progressive think tanks and the types of um, entities such as the Revolving Door Project house at uh, CEPR.net uh, uh, for people who are interested in our work. Um, the uh, support for institutions that would promote the idea of subpoenas of, corp- of major corporations that would suggest that people like Google, uh, the CEOs of Google and Facebook shouldn't get to choose whether or not they testify before Congress, but they should be made to do so uh, under threat of subpoena if necessary. Uh, there's just much less support for that. Whereas on the right, there's concentrated funding to come up with the best ideas for congressional hearings that could, say, undermine labor unions or go after uh, public employees, for instance, at the Internal Revenue Service. So going back to the 1990s, there were enormous number of hearings that made life really hard for people at the IRS and basically deterred IRS uh, employees from going after high net worth individuals who are avoiding or evading their tax responsibilities. Uh, And that continued into uh, Boehner's Congress with the uh, really just totally fabricated Lois Lerner uh, scandal, where they basically said that somebody... uh, was politicizing the enforcement of nonprofit tax law, which was just not true. But as a result, essentially far-right um, groups have now impunity to operate politically in violation of tax law because the IRS has been cowed by congressional Republicans. 
So what I would propose to congressional Democrats is that instead of deterring public employees from doing their job, they should deter corporate leaders from breaking the law. Right. Um, and then, go oh, yeah, go, go no, ahead. no, continue. And this is a systemic issue um, in terms of the ability of Congress is under Newt Gingrich or John Boehner to develop uh, the agendas that were carried forth by George W. Bush in 2001 and Donald Trump in 2017. Those agendas were built up in uh, opposition and in Congress. And what I would urge Democrats to do is to establish a governing agenda for 2021 and 2022 by establishing priorities and building out the evidence and case for action in 2019 and 2020 by holding high-profile committee hearings and engaging the public in the work of oversight. All right, so let's talk about those and so, so that people can understand here uh, in, in, in simplistic uh, levels. The, um, the, by, by doing these investigations now, what you are doing is you are basically plowing the fields and preparing them to grow policy uh, in the event that they're in the position two to four, six years out to start to implement these policies and you're developing a set of priorities. So from your perspective, like give us a sense of, of what if, if you were able to, if you had the resources and you were able to meet with, you know, a dozen or half a dozen or I don't know, three or four of the top um, uh, of the of the leaders of top committees, and say, look, this is this this is what your priority should be, and it should ultimately lead to uh, some type of reform program like X. What would those things be? Well, I mean, House Financial Services can step in and do a lot of the work that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is not doing by uh, obtaining the records from the sort of financial services companies that are cheating consumers. The CFPB was created, you know, under the leadership of Elizabeth Warren uh, and others to protect people. House Financial Services can expose how Wells Fargo and Experian and payday lenders and student loan servicers are abusing ordinary Americans. The House Ways and Means Committee can go after uh, tax avoidance and tax evasion, starting with the Trump family and, and Jared Kushner's uh, businesses, but moving on down the line to Robert Mercer and just the entire growth of industry of tax avoidance in this country, private equity as well. And they can look at big pharma and they can subpoena the records of big pharma and determine uh, how much they are making in profits and how much they are spending in marketing compared to the research that they are doing to actually cure real uh, medical needs of the country. And if you want to, for instance, have an agenda to reform pharmaceutical prices in this country, which is long overdue, you establish the need for that by a series of high-profile hearings in which you subpoena people uh, in which you have contentious back and forth between greedy executives and the representatives of the people, and a consensus can form for action. So in other words, if in 2019 um, we see um, a committee hearings where pharmaceutical executives have to concede that, that, in fact, we don't need to jack up these prices because of development, because we spend 80 cents on every dollar on marketing, um, then by 2021... The when uh, there is an attempt to, uh, let's say, allow the government to negotiate uh, prices or even to have price controls on uh, on medication or to limit uh, the, the number of years, let's say, that there are patent protections for these medications um, when the pharma executives say, but we won't be able to develop new product. You can say, well, look, look at this clip from uh, a year and a half ago when we when we when we when you testified that uh, most of your money is spent on marketing anyways. I mean, that's the idea there. Right. Right. And it's not just uh, relying on what they will say voluntarily. It's also subpoenaing the document so that you can have a forensic accountant go through the numbers and determine that their top line level that they concede is how much they spend on marketing versus research. The real number is X because there are real books that these companies have. And then there are the books that we know of publicly. And they're 
uh, often is a pretty considerable difference between what is known publicly and what is known privately. And that subpoena power uh, is so critical in bringing to light information that the rich and powerful would like to keep hidden away. There's two, uh, there's two other issues that you mentioned that um, I have particular interest in. Uh, one, we, we were talking about Sears on this program uh, just the other day. Uh, I've talked about Toys R Us, um, Anchor, um, uh, Glass, um, and, and others um, who um, major companies that were basically just sucked dry by um, by private equity and, you know, indicative of sort of the the cottage industry that um, are, are being run out of major companies across the country where the uh, where CEOs and maybe board of directors and, and, and a handful of of uh, of equity owners are are just basically running these 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 cottage industries sucking you know it's almost like legal embezzlement as far as i can tell but what what would let's say they brought in um the uh the ceo of of sears uh, lampert and uh and said like you know l- l- walk us through exactly what happened here how did you take control of a company drive it into bankruptcy destroy the pensions of thousands of, of workers, lose the jobs of thousands of workers, and walk away with hundreds of millions of dollars more money. What, where, what kind of legislation could that lead to? Um, so I think it can lead to both to legislation but also to potential enforcement priorities for an executive branch that were focused on um, enforcing the law. Because the the big picture strategy uh, of companies uh, of uh, private equity raiders uh, is to uh, strip assets um, and secure favorable tax advantages that the uh, previous owner of a company was unable to realize. So basically, structuring the acquisition in such a way that something is more valuable to them than it was before, not due to superior management, but due to manipulation of uh, the tax code, uh, the willingness to break contracts with unions or other or workers or other stakeholders, you know, cities that you know had given past subsidies in return for promises to keep businesses there, that sort of thing. Just a willingness to break a lot of rules and break a lot of agreements, some of which were legal, some of which were not. Um, so there both are elements of the tax code that you would want to be – you'd want to figure out what were they abusing and what can we fix to actually conduct tax reform, tax reform that would actually deter destructive behavior and encourage uh, real investment. But it would also uh, give a roadmap to a Treasury Department and an IRS uh, that were wanted to uh, – work on behalf of society as to like how these companies do the tricks that they do and what should you look for as enforcement agencies. Uh, that roadmap can be, would be very useful if you bring it out in public and you have a lot of uh, angry accountants with some time on their hands explaining stuff, and then the IRS doesn't have to uh, be outmanned, as they so often are in battles with these companies, because you have a lot of people doing open source investigations uh, into activities that are brought to light by congressional committees. But you also then create uh, an impetus to hire enough IRS uh, agents and forensic accountants and the like so that the IRS is no longer uh, always outpeopled. I mean, the IRS is just declining in size as corporations get bigger and more sophisticated at tax avoidance. Um, all right. You also mentioned uh, Blackstone and the effect it's having on the housing market. Blackstone, for people who don't know, is, I think, the largest uh, private equity uh, company in the world. Is that, or, you know, uh, I mean, how would you characterize them? Yeah, they're, and they're, um, they're at the cutting edge of figuring out um, ways to make money that other people might have too many shreds of morality to not go into. So, I mean, Blackstone worked in conjunction with uh, Jared Kushner to put together Trump's uh, first uh, overseas trip, which, 
you know, customarily the first overseas trip of an American president is to our loyal neighbors to the north, to Canada. Um, Trump's uh, involved a trip to Saudi Arabia, uh, more famous for hands on a glowing orb right. that uh, Trump uh, had with a bunch of um, leaders in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but obviously now a little bit more infamous for the beginnings of the bromance between Jared Kushner and MBS and all the other horrors with Saudi Arabia. But Blackstone was actually the secret like sauce behind that because Blackstone was seeking to get more business out of Saudi Arabia, and they used their control over the Trump administration to make this uh, trip happen. Blackstone basically goes where anyone with decency would not go. Uh, and they have become sort of vulture investors in uh, real estate in this country. They're becoming uh, a massive landlord, and they are about as bad a landlord as you can be. Um, and they're just abusing a variety of uh, housing and uh, mortgage-related laws uh, to make this very profitable for them. So and it right, appears so, like they're going to do that even more with the new tax uh, code. Okay. All right. So just, I mean, walk us through that because I'm, 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 I'm sort of fascinated by this. And we should also say that Blackstone was, I think, founded, at least one of the founders was Pete Peterson, who um, seemed to spend his uh, golden years trying to ruin the, those years of literally like three quarters of Americans uh, by uh, by trying to cut Social Security. Uh, with a relentlessness and a dedication that is uh, would be admirable if it wasn't so horrific in terms of its implications for people. But all right, so um, give it just give us a sense of like of, uh, of 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 that dynamic. Blackstone goes in. There's a lot of foreclosed properties around the country. They buy them up uh, sight unseen. They manage them from afar. Uh, they buy up enough of the housing product that they're able to control um, almost pricing on some level within specific markets or what? How, what, what, what is the mechanism in which they're, they're, they're using and, and what's problematic about it? Well, I mean, part of it is that um, they have the sophistication to structure their investments uh, and structure the debt that they rely upon to make these purchases in such a way that normal investors can't compete. And so, uh, properties are more valuable to Blackstone than they are on the market. Um, and that means uh, that they, uh, they can go in big. They can develop market power, which means that as the market recovers, they can um, raise prices uh, precipitously uh, for just you know, general reasons that monopoly are bad. Uh, they can gain market power. That's not quite monopoly, but uh, gives them some ability to increase prices. Their distance from these communities means that they suffer no personal reputational harms if and when they act like slumlords. There's, you know, if someone is a someone might be a bad landlord who owns like a few properties in a city, but he or she can be shamed locally, um, and there's some ability of the local authorities to rein in that conduct, and that is just not true when you have these essentially oligarchs based in New York, um, running housing in like Fresno, California. There's just no reach, uh, practically speaking, of the authorities in Fresno uh, to rein in the sort of mismanagement. But the big thing is that the tax bill written uh, you know, at the behest of Donald Trump, who was at least formerly a real estate magnate, uh, and also with Jared Kushner, also a real estate magnate, is incredibly beneficial to uh, housing uh, and to ownership and, and all sorts of debt and tax-related tricks that can be uh, conducted. And so if you are re able to avail yourself of all the real estate tax benefits in the tax laws currently written, you can make an enormous amount of money in uh, real estate. And Blackstone is incredibly well positioned to do that. And they're shifting their business model to really heavily focus on real estate as a result. That's amazing. I mean, we have a um, a massive, the biggest private equity company in the world, and they are literally shifting their uh, they're reorienting their entire business because of uh, a change in the tax code. I think is is as good of an illustration of the implications of this stuff as any. Yeah, and I think what, what's the great thing about oversight on 
corruption of this sort is that you can readily tie what seems to be unique in terms of Trump and Kushner and his administration's sort of individual peccadilloes about corruption to the substantive harm of real human beings, the people who are living in communities that are being devastated by Blackstone's mismanagement. And uh, like it's one thing if politicians are a little shady and a little corrupt, and obviously I think we should push back against that, but people can also become somewhat inured to that. They, unfortunately, expectations in our country uh, for politicians are pretty low right now. So to the extent to which corruption seems to just be about immorality in our leadership, I, I don't know how much it excites people, but you can build a political movement if you start pushing hard against the corruption that is tangibly undermining the lives of ordinary Americans. And I think that congressional committees can start to make that connection for people by uh, contentious hearings, by actually fighting against corporations that will fight back and raising up these sort of controversies. Because people really should understand that politics are about whether or not housing price, how the housing market is in your city. That's what the stakes are. It's not just uh, some sort of uh, fight between of symbols on uh, television. It's real life. And, 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 and it is incumbent upon uh, the, the Democrats and the people who are running these hearings to the extent that th- this happens to be able to sort of tie these smaller stories of, you know, let's say what Jared Kushner is doing into the broader systemic problems that um, are uh, that are created by government policy or, uh, or are fixed by government policy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so corruption is not just an issue of morality. It's an issue of tangible economic reality. Who wins and who loses in our economy is very frequently determined by government, but in ways I think uh, civil society and government has not good, done a good enough job of explaining this to people. And so um, I think the understanding how uh, people in hidden jobs in the executive branch, or at least like very little understood jobs, like at the Securities and Exchange Commission or FDIC, and all sorts of acronym organizations that people don't know much about at all. But the, the people, what the decisions people make have enormous consequences for who has what in our society and whether we become more or less fair economically. Um, I, I, I want to maybe touch on that in a moment, but I got to get your, your take. There was uh, this, this story this week is that, um, you know, just shifting gears slightly, because I know this is stuff that you also have, um, uh, you know, at the very least, pay uh, some attention to <clears throat> it, the uh, Chuck Grassley announced that uh, despite the deal that I mean, I, maybe maybe this wasn't part of the deal, uh, but over the past 45 days, maybe it is or 60 days, Chuck Schumer has made two separate deals that fast tracked the um, the nomination proceedings of now 30 federal judges who will sit on the federal judiciary for the rest of their lives. These are Trump picks. I should remind people this is not like some type of like bipartisan crew of people. Um, I don't know how many of them came from the Federalist Society, but I would bet that it would be close to 30. Um, And yet uh, Chuck Grassley uh, this week says, oh, incidentally, we're going to have hearings. I think they had hearings yesterday and only four uh, senators showed up. All these people are going to get confirmed or at very least they'll they'll uh, they'll go through their confirmation hearings without any scrutiny. What, what's your take on this? I mean, just am I let me put it this way. Am I completely out of my mind that Chuck Schumer doesn't seem to be following politics? Um, Chuck Schumer has entirely mishandled uh, this situation. Um, basically, McConnell um, the move McConnell made was to um, say that the Senate would be in session more often than expected in September and October because there are more Democratic incumbents up for re-election uh, in November than uh, Republicans. There are really only two Republican incumbents in the Senate who have tough uh, re-election races, uh, Heller and Cruz from Nevada and Texas. And so – Uh, The idea was that now I will take hostage the Democrats and say that um, if you want your incumbents to be like Joe Donnelly or Heidi Heitkamp to be able to um, uh, campaign back in their home state, 
you will have to like give me a bunch of judges. And this was a false choice because there's absolutely no reason why the Democratic incumbents who are up for re-election have to be in Washington, D.C. for each and every vote. I mean, voters understand that there's an election upcoming and senators spending more time in their state talking to the people in the state rather than casting votes that are not going to be decisive on judicial nominations. It's just not that big a deal. Right. These and are these so are let's, let's be clear. These are losing votes. Right. Like yes. even if they were to vote in the right way. Um, you know, relative to their base. I mean, in some, I, I could make an argument that perhaps not being there to not vote on these people is probably better for them politically, right? It's, like, at, least, it's at least, it's certainly not. I mean, Republicans who keep claiming that Democrats voting against against uh, Kavanaugh were at some risk. Um, the argument that they had to be in D.C. to vote against these other nominees made no sense. Uh, and basically the parliamentary trick is that all you needed is some center or local to D.C. every 30 hours or so. So Chris Van Hollen or Ben Cardin from Maryland or the Virginia senators or the Delaware senators could just show up and deny unanimous consent and then uh, – it would take 30 hours for each of the – it takes 30 hours of Republicans being on the floor in order to uh, keep pushing these judicial votes. And the rest of the Democratic senators could have done whatever they wanted, which you know, presumably would have meant campaigning for re-election. Um, the, but there was – among the groups that are most sympathetic to Chuck Schumer but work on judicial nominations, there was a consternation at this deal – by Chuck Schumer, but there was a belief that at least at a minimum, surely he got Grassley to agree to not hold committee hearings during the period in which the Senate was in recess. And it turns out that that rather important uh, detail was actually not part of Schumer's deal with uh, McConnell. But a what's deal, the mind deal? You, that did not involve either Feinstein or Grassley. Schumer just made a deal with McConnell and like wrote it like a newbie who had never done politics before. But what, I, I'm, I'm not even clear what the deal is. Like, isn't a uh, deal, the deal, don't you need two components to a deal, like a give and a get? Like, I get what the give was. I just don't know what the get was. Like, I, I mean, they would say that essentially that they uh, not only got their senators back to, to campaign, but they also uh, weren't missing votes. And as you and I discussed, the ability to avoid missing a few votes on judges seems like uh, a very minimal consideration. I, I, I would say that you could crisscross the land for decades and not meet a single voter who is going to uh, make a decision on their vote uh, based upon their senators missing a vote to confirm a circuit or district judge. Right. Like I would say, like the number of people who vote in that way probably rivals the number of people who vote under false names, like who take the names of the dead and go like that. I mean, so do you like first off, do you have any sense as to um, and I I don't know your relationship with staffers on the do you have any sense as to what the the Democratic Senate caucus feels about these things, a and B, like what Chuck Schumer is thinking? Like, is it possible that Chuck had like a bunch of like, I don't know, weddings to attend? And so he really <laughs> needed to go. Or I mean, is there any like I, even that explanation? I'd be like, ah, it's not the decision I would make. But uh, or like, I mean, what pot like, is it just like an in, unimaginable amount of sheer incompetence that's involved here? I just don't understand it. I think that the for about six to nine months in 2017, after the Women's March, uh, Senate Democrats under Schumer acted like they were not just in the minority, but were a part of the resistance, and that they recognized that this is a fraught period in American history, and they needed to fight everything. And that fighting spirit has abandoned uh, the caucus in the main. Um, uh, according to reports, Senator Warren was the only one to express um, any opposition to this decision. Um, I think people just wanted to get out of D.C. They didn't think about the details. And they're also just not used to um, the idea that you might want to fight on every judicial nomination. You would think the fact that the Republicans fought 
so tooth and nail to block all of Obama's judicial nominations going back to 2009, even when Senate Democrats had you know, between 58 and 60 senators, you would think that the um, Senate Democrats would have a little bit more fighting spirit on the issue of judges. But I think what uh, we've learned is that uh, Senate Democrats as a whole do not care about the nitty-gritty of uh, political issues that are not obvious. Um, and government matters, judiciary matters, and conceding these battles without a fight is really depressing. Is that is that a function of there being on the right people who are heavily invested in the outcomes of what, let's say, the D.C. Circuit Court or other uh, uh, court of appeals around the country, what, how they rule on, on issues of like of uh, of corporate responsibility and regulation and and uh, access to courts, et cetera, et cetera. So like when the Koch brothers say to Mitch McConnell, hey, look, we want these judges. Uh, judges are important to us. And if you want us to open up our purse strings for the uh, you know upcoming election, like there's nobody like that on the left. Right. Tom Steyer is not, with all due respect, is not coming up to uh, Chuck Schumer or someone from the financial industry is not coming up and saying, like, we really want judges who are going to uphold the right, uh, the ability of the government to uh, regulate the financial services. Or uh, we really want judges who are going to um, who are going to, uh, you know, uh, promote the idea that uh, the government has the ability to regulate on environmental grounds or access to the courtrooms for uh, for tort laws like there's just there's just no pressure on it seems to me on any of these democratic senators not, nor the leadership from a uh, donors and uh, and b which is donors uh, the electorate like the left just doesn't understand the relevance of this stuff yeah, the, basically, inside baseball in Washington has enormous consequences for how people live their lives and the d- stresses and dangers that they encounter in their everyday lives. And corporate America realizes this, and they have an enormous amount of paid lobbyists uh, and just Washington uh, monitors who provide intelligence to uh, corporations and rich people about what's happening and what really matters for their bottom line. And the left lacks um, the equivalent. I mean, that's why I founded the Revolving Door Project, was to kind of look into the issues that are a little bit under the radar um, in order to try to provide a modicum of a counterbalance to the advantage that corporate America has on that. And the hope going forward is that doing that sort of watchdog work on the left can link up with the net roots to provide a counterbalance because you've seen such an explosion of interest in politics and the emergence of groups like Indivisible. Um, And the hope is that working with this new sort of found passionate uh, grassroots um, in American politics and providing them some understanding of the key issues that are happening under the radar, that those groups can then provide pressure on leaders like Chuck Schumer to do better, because right now the status quo is uh, not working well. The uh, the conversion of this energy, electoral energy, into activist energy that uh, deals with these issues, I think, is going to be the... Um, like the the foremost important thing to happen after this election. Jeff Hauser, Executive Director of the Revolving Door Project at the Center for Economic Policy and Research. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. All right, Bye. folks. God. I just it just it drives me freaking nuts. That Chuck uh, Schumer? Well, I mean, look. See, this is what's super frustrating. Chuck Schumer drives me up a frickin' wall, right? Like, I, it, I I would spend three days a week protesting out in front of his house. <laughs> just, I would just bring Saul, and we would just sit there and protest. Um, But I would look around, and I realize, like, there's nobody else here. <laughs> this is not going to be effective. And the the... The broad swath of people that I get annoyed with when I hear like when when like, you know, I have conversations like this where it becomes so clear that we are um, that the 
the the broad left, the broad left, seems to completely um, forfeit three quarters of the game. Right, like it's 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 like we just want the superhero to come in and fix it all. And yeah, that's what I'm always saying. Right, and it's it's it is. What are you being facetious? I, of course I am. Well, I'm not saying you. I'm part of the left. Well, I know, but I'm I'm saying the broad. Yes, I am too, and I don't say that. Um, but I think broadly speaking. Uh, you know, the the left wants to have a superhero that comes in and 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 solves this all. There is if you you know there is just not a lot of of organizing or agitation around, broadly speaking. Obviously some uh people um who even care to engage in the in the sort of like small bore stuff that is where large changes in society happen over the course of five or ten years, right? Like you know, um, we have moments where there was you know there was movements uh, certainly during uh, the Obama years where we had uh, you know very active uh, coalitions of activists who were centered around housing. And uh, going and protesting in front of Blackstone. I mean, there was, uh, but it, we don't see these things sustained. We don't see these things funded by the donor class for obvious reasons, by even like, you know, uh, and, and, and the conversion of this energy that has gone into these elections, and understandably so, uh, to these issues. But it, but it, but it takes like education. And, and, and largely none of this stuff is, you know, I, I I I get annoyed at the. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say who I'm thinking of, but they're not in this room. Of of just sort of like this sort of these broad strokes about like you know, Jill Stein's going to come in and fix all this, right? Like, give me an effing break, right? Like, you know, pay attention to the smaller thing. Well, it's like watching baseball, like just when the playoffs start and being like, why don't they hit a home run right now? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, it is the, you know, like as frustrated as I am with Chuck Schumer, Chuck Schumer is just an empty vessel and he's getting pushed in certain directions and there's no one pushing in the right directions on this guy. Well, I think you would enjoy spending some time on the anti-capitalist left. If you don't like hero worship, because we're pretty much anti-hero. Yeah, I mean, I don't think everybody. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's the case. I mean, I think there's. Um, I, I don't. I, it would be nice if on the capitalist left, or you know, or at least the uh, somewhat like, so, you know, there was it because you know, unfortunately, uh, for the sake of our politics, the vast majority of the people on the left are still, um, you know, at least. Uh, capitalist friendly uh, on some level. And, you know, uh, that number is shrinking every day. Indeed it is, but not at the rates that are really, I think, going to, um, uh, you know, have... well, relative to socialism, but not to the exclusion of capitalism. Well, look, I think, I mean, ultimately, we have a theoretically a mixed economy now, right? It's just that the mixture is not quite is 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 largely out of whack. It's a bit fascisty. Yeah, and um, uh, but these structural things. I mean, it it would be nice if they we, we were to come in and have like a large structural makeover. But in the meantime, um, there needs to be some addressing of the um, the the smaller elements of this structure. Right. Because theoretically, this is structure, you could have cheaper housing if these things weren't happening. You could have um, uh, more protections for uh, consumers and financial products. You could have uh, much less expensive uh, pharmaceuticals, which drives uh, a lot of the cost of health care. You could do the same thing with metal, medical devices. I mean, there could be material benefits delivered to Every single American within the context of our structures as is, um, if 
there was a broader understanding on the left, a deeper understanding of the left and paid more attention to this stuff rather than the stuff that is a little bit more shiny. I totally agree with you. I I would assume everyone does. I always do. (laughs) I always do. Um, I'm actually preparing some sort of presentation for the next DSA meeting on how, uh, because a lot of people joined after the Kavanaugh confirmation hearing because they were like very angry and they want to do something. They want to get involved. So I'm preparing a presentation on how our different working groups can oppose bad Supreme Court decisions on a very practical level, as well as the system that led to Brett Kavanaugh in the first place. The thing that I like the most about DSA as an organization is, A, that they, broadly speaking, I think are the most savvy about politics, both in terms of like, and, and, you know, a lot of this came out of Occupy, frankly. I mean, at least this impetus of, like, setting up uh, committees that were actually, like, very, very astute in terms of policy. The the uh, Occupy uh, Committee on um, uh, Financial Reform was d- developed probably one of the most sophisticated documents that came out of the entire push for financial reform. And on top of that, though, more so, much more so than Occupy— um, largely because of the structure of the thing, the DSA is a lot more sophisticated about politics in terms of power. And so it's not just, um, you know, sophisticated when it comes to sort of like policy analysis, but also in terms of like, how do we strategically deploy uh, what power we have in such a way that brings us closest to our goals? And there's not, you know, and they do that without the sort of like, um, cross-purpose incentives that may come from an activist organization that is in D.C. and relies on their funding as a, as access to uh, donors or to certain legislators. I mean, so, um, yeah. It's interesting to me how DSA keeps getting these bumps when there is such a massive failure of especially the main party. And I, I think that speaks really well to how they've positioned themselves. Right. And there's nothing, listen, there's nothing about Kavanaugh per se, that is, um, you know, uh, a, a function of, uh, how, how can I phrase this? There's not, it is not, let's put it this way. It is not obvious that the response to Kavanaugh is democratic socialism, right? Like, like you could be opposed to Kavanaugh. Many, many, many people are. And, Democratic socialism, uh, you could you can still be a cold warrior. You could you could be like pro Merrick Garland and be opposed to Kavanaugh. It's just that I think that the idea is that there is not there are not there's no entities that provide what I've just sort of described, I think, on the left, uh, that kind of outlet. Well, it's our job to make those connections for people and to fil- facilitate them, making them on their own. Indeed. But um, I guess my point is we can't do it on our own. We need other entities to do it. And entities that are out there are saying like, that the solution has nothing to do with, like, you know, that it's completely irrelevant, these judges, or that you know, Chuck Schumer operates in a complete vacuum. Like, you, you, know, you can blame Chuck Schumer, and it is, I think it's political malpractice, um, but it's also, you know, Mitch McConnell's not sitting there going like uh, we need to do Kavanaugh because um, it, Mitch McConnell is doing it because his incentive structure is such that, you know, like the little rat that he is, um, you know, he knows where the cheese is. Well, we can understand the limitations of focusing on individuals when we you know, criticize someone like Jordan Peterson. But when it comes like to somebody like Chuck Schumer, we all of a sudden, you know, get a bit more reductive about it. Oh, yeah. We can hate the player and the game, like I always say. Like, I don't want to let any of these people off the hook oh, for being oh, no, no. But at the I, end of the day, you could put someone else in the same system and get the same result. I, I, I think that's true. But I'm not just saying I'm not saying don't hate the player. And I'm not saying uh, don't hate the, the, the game. I'm saying understand there's more than just one player here. <laughs> like, like there's other players that are also not doing their job. And this is, you know, an indictment of us as much as it is 
uh, an indictment of Chuck Schumer. You know, uh, I, I would imagine there's no one listening uh, to the sound of my voice who has, uh, well, I'm not going to say no one, uh, particularly in terms of this audience, but that we don't have a, a sizable a group of people in this audience who have written Chuck Schumer's office about, you know, uh, circuit judges or district court judges uh, or, you know, or about these type of small bore things. And unfortunately, Tom Steyer's not going to do it. So if we don't have a uh, hundred million dollars to dump into these races as an individual, we need a mass of people who are doing that uh, to create pressure. Yeah. And I'm not just saying, fo- you know, phone call, whatever, whatever the, the, the form in which pressure takes. Um, yeah. But yeah, we need an inside outside strategy. Indeed. Right? We indeed. need to build a massive militant labor movement that's capable of shutting the country down. And, you know, maybe you write some letters to Chuck Schumer on the weekend. Indeed. Uh, and you'll, and then, yeah, everybody will do it. We'll go to the, uh, go to the union hall, write the letters, et cetera, et cetera. Not All right, folks. Exclusive. Hey, just a reminder, this program relies on your support. You can become a member of the majority report by going to join the majority report.com. When you do, you will become a member for just pennies a day, dimes a day. I don't know. What is it? 50 cents a day. Was this show not like this free show? Was that not worth 50 cents? Well, if it wasn't, then we're going to give you more. If you become a member today, if you become a member right now, you will have access to the fun half, which is happening today. And in fact, you will have access to the fun half that happened yesterday and the day before. In fact, you can go back over the course of now seven plus years. Wait a second. We're super close to the. Uh, it could be today. When did this show start? Was it seven years to the day? I don't know. I think we did our soft launch around then. Holy crap. Anyways, you can go back and you get seven years of and it's searchable uh, on our app at majorityapp.com. You can search for, uh, you know, go back, see who our first guest is. Can't believe it. Still talking about the same damn stuff. Um, they, I think it was the guy who wrote the book, Winner Take All. Um, Nevertheless, the point is, uh, for just uh, pennies a day, you can become a member of the Majority Report. Go to jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. They have been with us since almost day one. In fact, they predate this show in terms of support for uh, these causes, and they were the ones who gave free coffee to people during the Madison uh, protests. Uh, This week on the Antifada... Jamie. Oh, uh, yeah. So this week on the Antifada, we took questions from you, the listeners. Or maybe not. You didn't take questions from me. From oh, from, okay. Uh, okay, from the listeners. Okay. Anyone who's listening right now who also listens to the Antifada, I'm talking to you. Uh, we, we got some great questions. So good job, everyone. We talked about um, my political tendency, which apparently people were still a little unclear about. Uh, how often we question our own beliefs. We talked about identity politics and uh, gave gave a little take on Angela Nagel because people still seem to be talking about her. Um, And we talked about Comrade Gritty, who is, we haven't quite decided yet if he's actually mocking the working class Philadelphia sports fans or if he is, you know, like a real man of the comrade of the people but could be we, a we bit tell above. people who comrade gritty, gritty is because this is like a meme that's getting oh. out there that people i think are not yeah so gritty is the new mascot for the philadelphia flyers which is a hockey team in philly um he has quickly been i, I don't even want to say appropriated because it's hard to appropriate something that's already yours but he's been uh appearing in many memes going around that are like anti-fascist and anti-capitalist in nature. So it's pretty go. cool. And uh, Matt? Yeah, Literary Hangover. Um, the Corey Robin Reactionary Mind episode is now available on YouTube for people who want to listen to that Whoa. there. So uh, check it out. Literary Hangover on YouTube. 
There you go, folks. Oh, All yeah. right. Patreon.com uh, slash the Antifada. YouTube.com slash the Antifada. I always forget to do that. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty is the number. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. If you want to be a part of this program, don't forget to check out uh, Michael Brooks' show. You can find that on uh, all of your favorite uh, podcast uh, servers or on Patreon and on uh, YouTube. We're gonna take a quick break. Come right back with the fun half. No, no. Elle est 